The disease with a thousand faces. Difficult to diagnose, complex and chronic. It will strike one in 900 Canadians. Lupus. This autoimmune disease alters patients' lives and if left untreated, can be fatal. At the BC Lupus Society, we provide support to people living with lupus. Because lupus is unpredictable, we strive to be dependable. Our programs include weekly support groups for patients and families in British Columbia. We make sure that educational resources and peer contacts are always available, including for patients facing a new lupus diagnosis. And every year, we help fund clinical training and medical research that benefit people with lupus. Through the BC Lupus Research Scholar Program, our goal is to advance treatments and discoveries to change the future of lupus. Our partnership with university researchers is unique in Canada and has helped understand the full impact of lupus and the effectiveness of lupus care. As part of our community, you're a valued part of annual events like our Lupus Gala and the Shed Light on Lupus Walk. These fundraising activities generate just part of the funds needed to sustain our work in patient support and medical research. With the generous support of donors like you, the BC Lupus Society will continue to be here for patients and families affected by lupus. Not only can we change tomorrow, we can brighten today. Thank you from the BC Lupus Society. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Reynolds. I'm the director of the Lupus Clinic at the Arthritis Center. And I'm pleased to be back again for another lupus symposium. This year I'm talking about treatments for lupus um, and I'll just get started. So an overview of my talk, I'm gonna start with current lupus treatments and based on our current guidelines. And then I'm gonna move forward to some of the newer treatments that are available for lupus nephritis, as well as for more general lupus and talk briefly about where I think treatment is headed for lupus patients in the future. So starting with lupus treatments today, our treatment goals are really to treat flares quickly and effectively, both to decrease symptoms, but also because we know that faster uh, identification of areas of disease activity can lead to earlier treatment and less scarring or damage. So we also would like to minimize medication side effects. I'm sure everyone agrees. Um, and with that, we wanna use the lowest doses of our medications that we can for the least amount of time. But also we need to do some monitoring blood work for many of the medications. We do regular eye examinations for patients who are taking hydroxychloroquine. We do bone density testing for anybody who's on significant doses of prednisone. I use interchangeably as steroids um, because that can cause osteoporosis. Um, and then we really try to get patients off of prednisone as much as possible. Unfortunately, for many patients, we also need to maintain um, disease control with maintenance therapy um, to prevent future flares. So this includes hydroxychloroquine, but also sometimes longer-term immunosuppression with medications like mycophenolate or azathioprine. So how do we pick? We, we target our therapies based on disease activity. We know lupus is a hugely variable disease and variations include degree of severity, as well as areas of involvement. So some patients may have mild disease with easily controlled flares. Others may have more severe disease, but still limited to one or two organs. Others may have really widespread disease in many parts of their bodies for varying severities. We also know that lupus disease activity can vary over time. So some that includes uh, onset of disease. So some patients have disease that starts in childhood. Um, others may not get their disease until much later into their 40s, 50s, and occasionally even into their 70s or 80s. We know some patients will have many recurrent flares and occasionally patients will just have one flare at the initial onset of their disease. And these variations in severity and, and in time um, are related to different immune pathways and um, through research, um, more and more is being learned about that in different patients. So in terms of how we treat patients now in 2023, um, our standard therapies are targeted towards mild 
moderate or severe disease with mild, moderate, and severe medications, um, or mild, moderate, and strong medications. Um, for patients with um, mild arthritis, sometimes uh, ibuprofen or naproxen can be really effective in all that they need to settle those symptoms down. Um, everybody should be on hydroxychloroquine, but hydroxychloroquine is particularly effective um, for mild flares of disease, so not if not on previously. Um, and then we will use low doses of prednisone, either by pill or sometimes we'll use topical forms, forms of steroids. For moderate disease, so more aggressive arthritis, more aggressive skin disease, we use uh, stronger immunosuppressing medications. So Plaquenil doesn't immunosuppress you. It does not increase your risk of infections, but immunosuppressive medications do. So things like methotrexate or azathioprine and, and, and Imuran are um, stronger medications. They are generally really well tolerated, but they do require more monitoring, like I said, more blood work to make sure that your liver and your bone marrow are happy taking those medications. Um, in moderate disease, we also use medium dose steroids. So, you know, if, if low dose is 10 milligrams, then medium would be 20 to 30. And then for more severe disease, we use stronger immunosuppression. So mycophenolate mofetil is really commonly used. Um, we still use cyclophosphamide, which has been around for a really long time. We use rituximab and we use Benlisto, or we'd like to. We'll talk about that one. Um, and then we use high dose steroids. And this is where we sometimes use intravenous steroids. So steroids that are by liquid into the blood, into the veins, or more high dose oral steroids. So this is a summary slide from the European guidelines on how to treat lupus uh, outside of the kidneys. There's all of our standard therapies all on one slide, so it's pretty busy, but it really gives you a summary of, of our current state. On the left side, we have adjunctive things, things that aren't medications, but can be really, really important in treating disease. So we know that lupus can flare with UV light exposure in the skin, and so sun protection is really important for everybody. Some patients do get um, skin rashes from the sun, so it's easier to, to recognize that, but even without those skin rashes, we know that the disease can be flared, and so we recommend sun protection for everybody. Vaccinations as well. We know that if you get influenza, if you get a severe infection, it's a, a, an increased risk for flaring your disease. And so we try to vaccinate to prevent that immune boost that you get from, from the infection itself. Um, and most patients tolerate the vac vaccinations really easily. The next few things are really highlighting um, the importance of decreasing the risk for heart disease, because we know that lupus itself increases the risk for heart disease. So exercising, avoiding smoking, maintaining good body weight, maintaining blood pressure at target, at lipids at target, and sugars at target. Um, and those targets are lower. They're the targets that we would recommend for anybody who already has heart disease when patients have lupus. Exercise is also really important in terms of maintaining bone health. We know that lupus will increase the risk for osteoporosis or low bone density and fractures, and exercise can help to prevent that. Underneath that is a mention of antiplatelets and anticoagulants. So patients with lupus frequently make antibodies that also increase the risk of blood clots. And we frequently uh, recommend aspirin or an antiplatelet agent. And then if they've had a blood clot before, they're usually on an anticoagulant me medication. And that's most frequently warfarin. In the middle of the slide is the really important um, immunosuppressive or immunomodulating therapies. On the left is mild disease, in the middle is moderate, and on the right is severe. And under that, it mentions the first line or the initial therapies that we're gonna use, as well as the therapies we'll add on or try if the first line doesn't work. So if we look at mild disease, first line, we're gonna use HCQ or hydroxychloroquine, and we might use glucocorticoids, GC, which is prednisone, either PO by mouth or IM into the muscles. So first line, we're going to give everybody Plaquenil and we might use some steroids. If that doesn't work, we're going to move on and go down the next step. And under mild disease is methotrexate or azathioprine. 
So stronger immunosuppressive therapy if the hydroxychloroquine and steroids don't work. The colors mean the strength of the evidence. So we know that there's really good scientific evidence for hydroxychloroquine in all levels um, in terms of controlling disease, preventing flares, and decreasing the risk of harms in the long term. Um, there's really good efficacy data for steroids in all of these treatment arms, but with a lot of side effects, so we try to minimize those doses. You see methotrexate and azathioprine are grade B or yellow, and that's because the, the level of evidence, the number of studies, the size of the studies is a little bit smaller, but grade B evidence is still pretty strong, and we know those medications work. If we move to the middle of the chart, we see moderate disease activity. And now our first-line therapies include the methotrexate and azathioprine right from the start, in addition to the plaquenolol hydroxychloroquine and the steroids or prednisone glucocorticoids. Underneath that, if you go further down in the first-line category, you'll see CNI or calcineurin inhibitor. And those are um, medications like cyclosporin or tacrolimus. Um, we have good evidence, we have grade B evidence of these, um, but we use them a little bit less frequently than methotrexate and azathioprine. Um, and then also with grade B, good evidence uh, for moderate disease is mycophenolate for cell sept. If a patient's got moderate disease activity and we're using first-line therapies and it's not adequate, then we would move on to the refractory category, the refractory column, and that's where we would consider something like BEL or belimumab. And I'll talk a little bit more about belimumab. It's in green. We have really good evidence that it works, but it's very expensive, and so it's never used first line uh, unless things like methotrexate or azathioprine are not working. Um, as second line, you know, the calcineurin inhibitors and mycophenolate would be used if the methotrexate or azathioprine that you tried first didn't work. And then we move over into the severe category. And again, first line treatment still includes hydroxychloroquine and probably prednisone. And frequently when it's severe disease, we would consider IV or intravenous steroids. So higher doses given right into the bloodstream or really high doses by mouth. And then when you look down that column, the next thing you come to is mycophenolate. And we use mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide as first-line therapy for most severe disease, adding rituximab if we're not getting adequate response for refractory disease. Those are our usual medications. There are things that we use when the refractory medications don't, use, or don't work. And then there's newer therapies that aren't on this chart. This was published in 2019, and we've had Fortunately, some new um, treatment recommendations since then, but not yet making it into the guidelines. Over on the right in the gray box is our target. So we would love for everybody with lupus to have disease and remission, not on any medications except Plaquenil, still allowed even with remission. Um, that's a really hard target to get you and not everyone's gonna get there. So we are also usually happy if we can get to low disease activity. And that means that there's very little um, that we can find, but maybe some cell counts are a little bit low, or occasionally there's a bit of a rash that is easy to control. Um, patients are allowed to be taking Plaquenil and low doses of prednisone, so less than 7.5 milligrams per day. And I actually make that less than five, so I don't consider it low disease activity till I can get patients down to five or less and then immunosuppressives, but in stable doses and well-tolerated. So things like methotrexate or azathioprine or mycophenolate might be continued, but the disease might be in a, in a good state in low disease activity. So that's kind of our current state. If we move on from there and look at things that are, aren't yet on our chart and our recommendations, but are hopefully going to be more widely used. Um, the first thing we've already talked a little bit about is belimumab, um, but there's some movement that might make it even more exciting coming down the road. So this was a targeted therapy for B cells in lupus patients. It was the first medication that was really designed for lupus, um, much more targeted than older medications. 
it impairs or blocks the ability of those B cells in our immune system to proliferate. And we know in, in lupus patients that there's B cells that recognize our own cells, so self-reactive, auto-reactive B cells that make antibodies to our own tissues and cause the inflammation and damage. So stopping them from being able to proliferate and cause that damage is, is really um, a, an appropriate target for most patients. Unfortunately, the volumumab doesn't work for everybody, but for the patients that it works for, it's been very, very safe and very well tolerated. It's been a really useful medication. Um, it initially was studied in the joints in the skin, um, and we'll come back to that. It's more recent studies in the kidneys, but it's never been studied for lupus in the brain. It's really hard to study that. It's quite uncommon. Um, and there's a few other areas where we don't have as much evidence, um, but in Increasingly, we are using it for more and more of the uh, lupus activities. And when I say we, I usually mean um, most of the places around the world. I don't get to use it very often because of the funding issue. And I'll touch base on that. So this is a cartoon too now if you don't care. Um, B cells, as I said, are part of your immune system. They are making antibodies and uh, attacking antigens and antigens or anything foreign that we're supposed to get rid of. In order to keep surviving, a B cell needs this little green blob called bliss. That's a survival signal. Without it, the B cells don't proliferate and they will eventually die. Belimumab or Benlista is in yellow and it sops up the, the bliss that's floating around. So it, it uses it up so it cannot bind to the B cells. And so therefore it prevents the B cells from getting that survival signal and they die. And therefore they're making less antibodies to you um, and less um, stimulating less aspects of the immune system. It doesn't kill all of the B cells, but it actually kills some good ones as well as some bad ones. But as I mentioned, it's surprisingly well tolerated. There's other pathways of the immune system that can compensate. So belimumab was originally approved in 2011, both in the US and in Canada. In the original studies, there wasn't um, anyone with active kidney involvement. Um, so it was just for lupus outside of the kidneys. They did develop um, a self-injection version in, and this was approved in 2017. Um, so the initial was an intravenous medication and then it was switched to cell Q. Um, but as I said, you know, the, the um, approval came from Health Canada to sell, tell us that we they agreed that it was effective and that it was safe for lupus patients. But this funding um, aspect has been a, a huge issue for us and that it was not um, picked up through any of the public payers in Canada. Um, so some private insurance plans will pay for it, but even that, not every private insurance plan will cover it. And as a result, it's really not been widely used in British Columbia. So moving on from belimumab, I'd like to talk a little bit about anaphrolimab or safnilo. This is another exciting molecule that we have, hopefully are going to have access uh, in BC as well. It's similar to belimumab in that it's used for general lupus um, and they're still doing the studies for lupus in the kidneys. It's a different immune target. So I talked a little bit about the varying um, pathways in the immune system that are over or underactive in different lupus patients. This one is targeting something called interferon alpha, which is a protein, and it, um, it's very commonly overproduced in lupus patients. The studies were positive, and it received approval by the FDA first, and then by Health Canada. So it is Health Canada approved. Um, and then even more exciting, in December, it was approved by this funding agency that is a bridge. It looks at the cost effectiveness um, and the provincial formularies use that information to help make their decision as to whether they're going to cover this medication. Um, so we're really hopeful that anaphrolimab will be available through Pharmacare um, for, for specific patients with lupus. Um, because it's been available in the U.S. for longer, some of the physicians down there have been using it even more. 
Um, and both in the clinical trials and then in their practices, we see that it's really, really effective for severe skin um, lupus. It's very good for arthritis. And then we're going to gather more and more um, real world um, information as it's been out in terms of how effective it is for other types of lupus activity. So I am hopeful that that's going to come soon. I don't know what soon means, um, but I'm hopeful it's going to be paid for through Pharmacare. Switching gears just a little bit, I thought I should also add a couple of things that are not on that initial chart, um, but that we do use currently. So some patients with lupus will have inflammation around the sac, around the outside of their heart called pericarditis. Um, and this can happen both outside of lupus and, it, and with lupus. Um, and colchicine has been widely used for patients who get pericarditis for any reason, including lupus, and it can be really effective. It's an old anti-inflammatory, so it's not immunosuppressing. Um, we use it a lot for gout patients as well. Um, and it's really well tolerated, so it's a nice non-immunosuppressing medication that we can use for pericarditis. In addition, because the, the skin is such an accessible place to treat topically. We like to use um, medications in this cream or lotion form, so topical application, so that there's no absorption in the rest of the body and we don't typically have to worry about kidney or, or um, liver side effects. And one in particular for cutaneous lupus that's quite effective is protopic. It's unfortunately quite expensive, but it is um, being used. And then I thought the kidney lupus would be our next sort of specific organ we need to talk about in detail. So lupus nephritis affects up to 60% of patients with lupus at some point. We know it's more frequent in patients who have Asian, African-American, or First Nation um, backgrounds, and it's considered a severe or major organ involvement for lupus. Therefore, treatment usually requires really strong immunosuppressive medications, as well as high doses of steroids. We monitor closely for lupus in the kidneys by doing blood work and urinalysis. And we know that if we can pick it up early, that earlier treatment results in better outcomes. So less inflammation leads to less kidney damage and less risk of complications down the road. We know that lupus nephritis occurs more frequently in the first two years since disease onset. So after you start getting symptoms of lupus in those first two years is when we really, really are watching closely for lupus nephritis. Um, we keep a close eye pretty much out through five years, but it certainly can occur later in some patients. So most patients in BC and, and in Canada in general receive a kidney biopsy to assess for the type of inflammation in the kidneys and the severity, how widespread it is and how much inflammation is there. Um, most of our patients with kidney biopsies actually do have severe inflammation, and so they usually do need treatment with high doses of steroids and mycophenolate mofetil or cyclophosphamide. In Canada, we're using a lot more mycophenolate or Celsept, um, with cyclophosphamide being used much less frequently. If the kidney inflammation doesn't improve enough, there's a risk of scarring or damage, and we are watching closely for um, at least partial response within the first three months or so. And then we want to see ongoing improvement um, out to a, you know, even a year to get full response is okay, but we want to see that continue improvement. If we're not seeing it quickly enough, um, if there's still persistent um, levels of inflammation, we will sometimes add cyclosporin or tacrolimus. And then if those medications aren't working, um, then rituximab can be added. Slides weren't advancing. So new treatments for lupus nephritis. Um, these are all add-on therapies to our current treatment regimen. So it's not like we're substituting, we're adding things on to improve the speed that we can see a response and to get a more complete response. So not everyone's kidneys respond to our current therapies. In December of 2020, the FDA approved belimumab for lupus nephritis. So they did special studies looking at belimumab for the kidneys, and those were positive. So it was approved. And then in 
and, and I should say, and Health Canada approved it shortly afterwards. And then in January of 2021, so just a month later, the FDA also approved Vocalosporin. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then I also wanted to talk about open tuzumab, which is another exciting medication for lupus nephritis um, targeting those B cells that we talked about. So bulimumab, the phase three trials for the kidney disease were published in September of 2020. Health Canada approved it um, in 2021. Um, but that meant that we could access it, but we didn't have any funding for it. And then again, just like with the anaphrolimab in December, same month, we also got approval through this funding body CAD of um, saying that it was cost effective for patients with lupus nephritis. So we're hoping that means that we will also have access to bulimumab for lupus nephritis, at least for BC Pharmacare, but we're still waiting to hear their decision. So what about vocalosporin? So I put this in here because a few years ago, the um, vocalosporin chief scientific officer actually came and spoke at the lupus symposium. Some of you may remember that. Um, this is a medication that was developed in Victoria by Irenia, which is a local company. Um, it's oral, it's pills, not injection, which is also very appealing for many patients. Um, it works in a similar way to cyclosporin and tacrolimus, which are older medications, but it's generally felt to be better tolerated, safer, and more effective. So it doesn't need to be monitored like cyclosporin, and it um, gives a higher complete renal response or kidney responses. However, the bad news is that based on medication marketing, it's been marketed in the US at a really, really high level at, at $100,000 a person or something. And so we don't think that it's ever likely to be approved in Canada, even though it's safer and better tolerated, that things like cyclosporin and tacrolimus really do work and are probably going to be um, funded preferentially. In fact, because of the success with the vocalosporin studies, I think our local nephrologists and, and nephrologists in most places are using more calcineurin inhibitors, not necessarily vocalosporin. Um, and then I mentioned obentuzumab or Gaziva, which is a medication that's actually already available to treat blood cancers. So again, rheumatology borrowing from the oncology field. Um, it works the same well, same way as ritux rituximab. So these two medications wipe out a lot of the B cells. Venlista really stops them from proliferating and eventually they will decrease in numbers. But the rituximab um, depletes more and the obentuzumab is really a stronger still at depleting those B cells. In terms of studying medications for, for any disease, the medications have to go through different phases. Um, and it's only after there's positive data showing benefit and safety at the phase three level that, patient, that uh, companies submit to FDA or to Health Canada to ask for approval. So obituzumab has only shown positive results for phase two, but they were so positive and so um, impressive that the phase three trial is ongoing, but there's already some access for this medication in the US because it's already being used for another indication. Um, it is also an intravenous medication to add on to standard of care. Um, but sometimes when we're borrowing medications like this, we have a little bit easier time to access them if studies confirm that it's useful at the phase three level. So that's three new things for lupus nephritis and one new one for general lupus. Um, I think things are gonna pick up and we're gonna see lots more new medications um, coming down the pipelines. And that's because there's so much work being done in terms of research on the specific pathways in the immune system that are not functioning properly in lupus patients, either over or underactive, but different pathways for different patients that with, um, newer scientific methods, they can use a lot more data and um, kind of create a customized pathway for an individual patient, which will then allow us to target those pathways um, without sort of trial and error with our medications. Um, there's also improved 
speed at the, with which they can develop the newer medications. So if a new pathway is identified, a new um, protein or um, receptor, then they can make a medication to block it or to um, increase it depending on the need um, much more quickly than they used to be able to do in the past. And so I think we'll see both better targeting of the therapies, but also more therapies over the next five to 10 years, which is really great news. So you've listened to me long enough. In summary, I'd like to just kind of bring you um, some information about the new treatments that are being expected in the new near future. So both belimumab or benlista and anaphrolimab are um, approved, and we're just waiting to hear whether or not they'll be funded. Um, belimumab would be specifically for lupus in the kidneys, and anaphrolimab would be for lupus generally not in the kidneys. Um, Voclosporin, I don't think we'll have access to, but I think it's really changed the way that we treat lupus nephritis for a lot of patients, and I think that'll really improve our, our outcomes, which is great. And then obentuzumab is going to take a little bit longer, but I really do expect it to be available for um, more resistant uh, kidney disease that's not responding to our, our baseline therapies. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation. I'd be really happy to answer any questions. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it to the live question and answer session at the end of the week. I'm on an airplane, um, but I'm happy to answer by email. So if you email the BC Lupus Society, um, I'm happy to send back any, any answers I can. Um, and hopefully you're learning lots from all the other speakers. I've Try to help recruit a few new faces for you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all in person at some point in the future.